Thanks for tuning in to this week's News Recap. First headline, Big banks and credit card giants continue swiping right on crypto. Bank of New York Mellon, the nation's oldest bank and a custodian of $41 trillion in assets, is making a move into crypto. According to the Wall Street Journal, the bank will hold, transfer, and issue Bitcoin and other cryptos on behalf of its clients. Quote, we are starting with the anchor in this space, which is custody, Mike Demacy, head of Advanced Solutions at BNY Mellon, told Coindesk. He went on, then it comes down to what our clients need from us. So that's not just safekeeping of these assets. They want to leverage them for lending purposes. They want to leverage them for collateral. Then we are also looking at issuing digital assets like tokenized securities, real assets. BNY is the first large U.S.-based custodian to release a plan for storing crypto as it would any other asset. Although BNY declined to say which crypto native companies it is using to build out its solution, it did confirm that the bank is relying on outside partners. MasterCard announced it will offer its merchants the option to receive payments and select cryptocurrencies later this year. The company philosophy towards cryptocurrency is simple. Quote, it's about choice. MasterCard Vice President for Blockchain and Digital Asset Products, Raj Damandaran, wrote in a blog post. MasterCard is not attempting to pressure consumers or businesses into using crypto, he said. Rather, they are here to, quote, enable customers, merchants, and businesses to move digital value however they want. Demondaran later highlighted the four key items MasterCard is seeking in its crypto asset selection process. Consumer protection, strict compliance protocols, adherence to local laws, and consumer demand. According to Coindesk, MasterCard has previously interacted with crypto through partnerships with WireX and Uphold. But those programs were only for payments, not settlements. This will be the first time MasterCard will be accepting crypto payments without converting it to fiat for merchants. Next headline. As ETH futures launch, analysts say Ethereum's future looks bright. CME Group, the world's largest derivatives marketplace, launched an ETH futures product on Monday. In an interview with The Block, Tim McCourt, CME's managing director and global head of equity products, said ETH contracts were traded roughly 388 times to the tune of roughly 19,400 ETH or $33 million. McCourt said, quote, the response to Ether has been overwhelming. According to CME, each contract is made up of 50 ETH and priced in U.S. dollars, with a minimum trade size being five contracts. The enthusiasm about ETH futures spilled over into the price of Ether, which roared past $1,800 on Tuesday, over triple its price when the CME futures were announced in mid-December. It was still trading around there as of press time. Also, Ethereum 2.0 reached a milestone indicating a bullish future. Over 3 million ETH is now staked on the network. Chao Wang, co-founder of Masari Research, tweeted that the earliest traditional financial institutions that bought BTC are already looking at ETH, if not bought already. And rightfully so, the most used crypto network and plus future of finance, plus a potential deflationary monetary policy narrative make it extremely compelling. He projects the price of ETH will be between $5,000 and $20,000 by the end of this bull run. Next headline, Bitfinex repays Tether ahead of schedule. Last Friday, crypto exchange and sister company to Tether, Bitfinex, announced that it had repaid a $550 million loan to Tether. In a statement on its website, Bitfinex said, quote, all interest due on the loan has been paid. The loan has now been repaid early and in full and the line of credit has been canceled. According to the block, quote, Tether initially opened a credit line worth $900 million for Bitfinex, of which $750 million was used by the exchange because Bitfinex was in need of short-term cash in 2018. At that time, Bitfinex lost access to $850 million in customer and corporate funds when they were seized by a payment processor, Crypto Capital. Bitfinex repaid two installments of $200 million on the loan in 2019 and 2020, leaving the balance at $550 million, which they paid off this week. This was the third and final installment of payments to close out the loan, which was due in November 2021. The financial lifeline has been heavily scrutinized since April 2019, when the New York Attorney General's office alleged Bitfinex used Tether's loan to secretly cover the exchange's shortfall. In other stablecoin news, Tether's market cap recently crossed the $30 billion mark. Next headline. DeFi Roundup. 
The St. Louis Fed released a DeFi research paper last Friday, which concluded that while DeFi is still, quote, a niche market with certain risks, it also has interesting properties in terms of efficiency, transparency, accessibility, and composability. The paper was written by Fabian Schar, a professor for distributed ledger technologies at the University of Basel. Next in the roundup, DeFi protocol Yearn utilized its treasury to pay back victims of the 9.7 million DAI flash loan attack last week. According to the Yearn.Finance Twitter account, this act of kindness, quote, was done as a one-off celebration of going through the DeFi rite of passage. Which is one way to put it. Next in the DeFi roundup. Europe's largest telecommunications company by revenue, Deutsche Telekom, is now one of the main data providers to Chainlink, according to Coindesk. Chainlink, a DeFi oracle service, provides smart contracts with data from the real world, which means Deutsche Telekom is providing active data support for DeFi. Next headline. MEV is becoming a problem on Ethereum. A recent research report by Paradigm on minor extractable value, aka MEV, highlighted the potential pitfalls that come with allowing miners to arbitrarily include, exclude, and reorder transactions within blocks they produce. Paradigm defines MEV as, quote, the measure of profit a miner can make through their ability to arbitrarily include, exclude, or reorder transactions within the blocks they produce. The report indicates that while most miners are not exploiting this feature now, within the last three months, Paradigm says, quote, a small but meaningful portion of the hash rate has been observed exploiting MEV themselves, revenue sharing with traders rather than allowing permissionless fee auctions, and selling access to private memory pools. Paradigm believes miners will pursue even more exotic forms of MEV, potentially even colluding, which could end up harming users in Ethereum, creating a sort of invisible tax on the protocol and encouraging consensus instability. Additionally, Paradigm says MEV can be seen on Bitcoin as well, though it is less of an issue there. Crypto Quick Hits Twitter CFO is considering adding BTC to the company's balance sheet, as well as paying employees and vendors in the digital currency. Uber may accept payment in Bitcoin, but has no plans to purchase it as a reserve asset. Coindesk reports that Amazon is hiring for a new digital asset-based project in Mexico. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen spoke publicly on cryptocurrency for the third time, saying, quote, I see the promise of these new technologies, but I also see the reality. Cryptocurrencies have been used to launch the profits of online drug traffickers. They've been a tool to finance terrorism. In the oddest news of the week, actress Lindsay Lohan sold a crypto collectible on Rarible for $17,000, which was immediately flipped for $50,000 one hour later. Time for fun bits. German police stymied when trying to seize $81 million in Bitcoin. Reuters recently reported that German prosecutors have confiscated from a Bitcoin miner a stash of 1,700 Bitcoin, worth about $81 million as of press time. However, all they have is this hardware wallet. What they don't have is the man's password to unlock it. The Bitcoin miner was sentenced to two years in prison for installing Bitcoin mining software on other people's computers without asking permission, which is how he built his stash of 1700 BTC. He already served his time and maintained his silence about the password throughout, while the re police repeatedly tried to crack the code. As Alex Gladstein of the Human Rights Foundation tweeted, quote, This means they didn't confiscate anything. Not your keys, not your coins. Thanks for tuning in. To learn more about Michael, Genesis, and Genesis Treasury, be sure to check, to check out the links in the show notes. Don't forget, we are now on YouTube. Subscribe to the Unchained Podcast YouTube channel today. Unconfirmed is produced by me, Laura Shin, with help from Anthony Yoon, Daniel Ness, Dan Edelbeck, Shashank, and the team at CLK Transcription. Thanks for listening.